Professor Alessandro Golombievsky Teixeira is a world famous economist. He has a very oriental Chinese name, Fu Xin. He is a professor at the School of Public Policy and Management of Tsinghua University and a professor at Tsinghua Schwarzman College. He has rich experience in politics, having served as the Minister of Tourism and the Special Economic Advisor to the President of Brazil. In 2008, Teixeira was named Latin American Person of the Year by the Financial Times. He won Brazil's highest honor, the Command of Rio Branco, in 2008 and 2014. Today, join us at Tsinghua University as we meet with this full-time professor who has lived in China for four years. What does he think of China's development? What are his expectations for China-Brazil cooperation? Uh, the first thing I would like to talk about is your name, which is Fu Xin, and it seems to reflect very oriental cultural ideals, which are auspiciousness and wealth. And how did you come to select these two characters? That's a very, very nice question, uh, because when I arrive in China, uh, well, I have my Western name, but uh, every, every Chinese would ask, what's your Chinese name, right? So I have to sit with my family, my wife, and decided because we decided when we move here that uh, we're going to stay here for a long time okay and and my daughter uh, w was only one years old so she goes to a chinese school so she needs to have a chinese name so first we came up with the family name fu okay and then we we saw interesting names for for me for my wife and my daughter so so basically what we want is a good vibration good energy positive something really positive and and that's the nice thing about the Chinese culture because you can choose names that have meanings so in some Western culture like us we have names that doesn't have a meaning itself so that's why we did a, a very careful research and we took our Chinese uh, Mandarin teacher to help us with the name so that's why we come up with in my case Fu Xin my daughter Fu Lin and my wife, Fu Ming. Oh, that's a really nice set of names. I love <laughs> yes. it. Recently, since the beginning of 2020, vaccines and economic recovery have become central pillars of the global effort that continues against COVID-19. And so aside from her own domestic anti-epidemic measures, China is providing vaccines to numerous other countries, including to Brazil, whose main source of vaccines is currently China. As an unbiased witness to the steps taken in China against the pandemic, how would you relate uh, how would you rate the performance of the government of China regarding disease control and economic recovery? And what elements of China's experience do you think can be applied in those other countries and regions that are still severely affected? I, I think when you look at the crisis, the pandemic crisis, mm. one of the things that you can see, and if you want to give a number to China, is going to be 10. Okay. Because with the size of population and the way China controlled the pandemic mm. in the country, uh, it, it's outstanding performance. Countries that normally, traditionally, would do a good performance, like United States, or even the largest country in Latin America, like Mexico and Brazil, they did mm. horrible. Okay, you see the numbers in the United States, you see the numbers in Brazil up to now, and there's disaster. Mm. So the first conclusion that we don't know how to manage uh, crisis and disaster, that's clear. Okay? And uh, in the other, on the other hand, China did a great job, but did a great job because it took very serious, first, testing. That's very important. Mm. First, testing. So you see tests everywhere. Other countries like United States, even in Europe, even in Brazil, there is no test available. Some people, they test, others, they don't test. So how do you measure? How do you know how fast it's going to spread? So you don't know. Mm. Okay, so you cannot have control. So China did a very good job in controlling. So that's the first thing. Second was very serious in put all the research, and that's very important, all the research uh, resources, people, money, to come up very fast with vaccines. And already we have at least four different vaccines already being prepared in China. Two of those are well known around the world. Uh, the Sinovac and Sinopharm, okay? One are being using very much inside China, okay? With uh, more, I think the numbers is more than 400 million people vaccinated in, in more than, than one month. The number of doses mm. 
So the control is very important, the vaccination is very important, the research is very important, and, and it is most important. Like me, foreigner, I was out of China when the pandemic ha happened. I was in Portugal, and then to come back, they put me almost one month in quarantine, and I think was very positive. Uh, although it's very tough for a person to be in quarantine for almost a month, especially my wife and my kid, but it's very serious. You know, I arrived, I went to quarantine in Shanghai, two weeks in Shanghai, then I came to Beijing, more a week quarantine at home, so almost uh, three weeks, and then more one week in quarantine in Shenzhen. Uh, so uh, that's very important to me, uh, because that shows how leadership is, is being uh, applicable to a disaster case, and, and that's why I, I rate China 10. Of course, we can understand that the quarantine is very important, but how did you feel during that time? Quarantine, uh, it's a very tough time because you are, you are <laughs> almost arrested mm. in a, a small uh, hotel room. But I think if you have an understanding, that's what I was talking to my, my wife. I said, this is important because when you are out, you know that you went through the quarantine, you are not contaminating anybody else. And this is the important thing, the, the, the sense of the, the, the China society and civilization means that the collective is more, more important than the individual. Mm -hmm. And when I compare to my country right now, unfortunately, uh, leadership of my country is very weak because they, they believe that the individual needs to overcome the collective. Mm -hmm. And that's the mistake, because we are not in a normal situation. We are in a pandemic that kills people. For us, that we live together, it was time to talk, to discuss future plans, to, 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 to spend more time with our daughter, 24 hours for uh, almost a month. You know, so, so it's, I, I think I took it very well uh, this time. And I would do it again uh -huh. if I needed it. Okay, that's great. So there's always a silver lining, isn't it? More time with the family. Yes. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, as we know, China is a very important partner in Brazil's fight against COVID-19, exporting 100 million doses of the vaccine to Brazil. And unfortunately, President Bolsonaro recently made comments politicizing the pandemic and stigmatizing China, which was seen as an attack on an old friend. Uh, do you know the reason why the president made this about face? And how do you feel about it? And is it related to pressure from some Western powers? Look, I, I, at first I feel very bad. He's always uh, downplay the importance of this. He mm. said clearly in all the newspapers, oh, this is a little flu, you know, you can go out. If people die, they die. So mm. it's uh, very stupid questions that we should expect for a leader of a largest country in Latin America. Okay? So that's the first thing. Second, I think uh, he doesn't think what he says, okay? Because China is the first trade partner, is the first investment in Latin America, and is really helping because the majority of doses that you receive it are from China, mm -hmm. are manufacturing from the Sao Paulo government at Butantan uh, with help and a lot of help mm -hmm. uh, of Sinovac, okay? So he should be more careful what he says, okay? And third, I think there is not a pressure from uh, Western countries about this issue. I think it's his personal issue, okay? And, and his lack of a good ability, and I would say at least uh, politeness, to treat a partner that is helping you. Mm. Uh, so that's the situation. And of course, this is affecting the relation between Brazil and China, and more is affecting the people of Brazil. Mm. You know, so everybody is a general, I would say, agreement in Brazil that he's misconducting uh, the crisis in Brazil, taking to politicize uh, a situation that is a human disaster. And I think no one in the world as a leader has the right to do so. He, he was elected to help Brazil and to help Brazilian people and he's doing the uh, direct the opposite, mm. in my opinion. So, in your opinion, the Brazilian people don't support his, this position of his? Some part of the Brazilian people support because mm. they have the same view of him. They, they, some people think, okay, I don't need to use masks. Uh, he, he, this thing of staying home is taking my individual rights, you know? Mm. You always have support in one. But the majority of Brazilian population, they are scared, okay, because the pandemic. If he act, in my opinion, if he act earlier, probably Brazil would be out already with the economy working. Mm. But because he, 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 
he goes against science, he goes against what's happening in the world. So Brazil is taking more time to recover economically. A and basically that's the main problem. Yeah, it's really a shame, isn't it? Uh, mm. it's, it's very a shame. Mm. <laughs>The year 2021 is the centenary of the Communist Party of China. Over the past 100 years, the Communist Party of China has united and led the Chinese people to achieve the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. And socialism with Chinese characteristics has entered a new era. What blessings does Professor Teixeira have on the centenary of the Communist Party of China? Let's continue. The year 2021 is very significant for China, being the centenary of the founding of the Communist Party of China and the beginning of a new stage in the battle to eradicate poverty and build a moderately prosperous society. So could you discuss your views on the CPC and its 100 years? And do you have a message of congratulations or best wishes you'd like to share? And what do you hope to see in China's future? As you said, it's a beautiful story. When uh, the Communist Party was founded in 1921, in Shanghai. So everybody that likes politics or studies likes to see the evolution of the party. And that's very important. Why? Because the party, uh, different, the many parties in the world achieve modernization. They evolve with the China challenges. So, so in my opinion, the party has been doing a great job in different levels and in, in different areas. And I believe that this is important for China because with the strong leadership of the, the Communist Party in China, China achieve development. China today is not just a, a country that has economic growth, but has development okay? and has creating different paradigms. For example, the socialism with Chinese characteristics, it, it, it's the exclusive model of China. It, it has absorbed the Chinese characteristics. Now is a new stage of development in China called, uh, I would say, scientific development. Okay? We have a dual uh, circulation system in one side. Uh, we have uh, the in domestic economy, very, one of the strong engines. The other side you have the exports. So I believe the Communist Party is uh, leading China in the right direction. Uh, especially not just the economic field, but social field. For example, eradication of extremely poverty in China. Two decades ago, China was a poor country. And we move, after 20 years, China is the best example of evolution in terms of economic growth. Okay? So uh, that's important. So I wish for the Communist Party long life, continue in that direction because it's very important for China. It's very important, not for China, for the world, because it's a good example of how uh, leading a nation, how to plan a long-term nation, how to achieve goals, how to change policies, okay? So China, really, the Communist Party, he implemented what really any uh, people from the academia, like me, that study public policy, want to see in a country. Uh, planning, execution, reformulation, replanning, all the different stages of public policies there. And I would like to see China in that way. I want to see China as a developed country very soon. I want to see China give an example of how to take people out of poverty, how to combine economic success with social success. Why? Because China is important for the world, especially for developing nations. Because, of course, you cannot copy a developed path, you cannot copy a developed model. You, you can, but you can look China as a, a good example. And that's I'm wishing. So congratulations for the 100th birthday of the Communist Party. And I hope I will not be here, but I want to congratulate for the next 100th birthday. So um, as a renowned economist, you understand very well that economics and politics are often two sides of the same coin. And we've seen some countries, such as the USA, interfering in the economic relationship and the internal affairs of other nations in response to claimed concerns about human rights. Uh, what do you think about this practice? And secondly, after quitting the UNHRC, the Human Rights Council, three years ago, now Washington has announced its intention to rejoin, but this will require the votes of 96 other countries. Do you think the Americans will work hard to convince 
Brazil to support their re-entry? And what is the overarching U.S. strategy when it comes to human rights? And how do you think that would affect global relationships? We have four years of Donald Trump, mm. okay? And Donald Trump, I think, is an outlier in terms of the, how American people feel. We okay? hope so, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then uh, the policy of uh, uh, Donald Trump, in my opinion, was a bullying policy, okay? Confrontation. Working in a multilateral level uh, requires for you to have the capability to listen, to process, and to work in groups. That's something mm -hmm. that I didn't see in the government of Donald Trump. So, so that's the first thing. I think Biden is a different uh, political person. He wants to work in a multilateral level. And obviously, we know, being from Latin America, that the United States is engaged, and he thinks they have a mission in the world uh, to, 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 to show their, how do I say, their democracy is the best system in the world and to try to impose sometimes their model mm. to other nations okay? and don't respect other nations. I, I think the case of human rights is clearly, okay? Uh, if I was a president of a country, I would say, Biden, solve your own problems because the United States has huge problems in human rights, okay? Mm. Uh, we see minorities in the United States. You're talking about Latin, you're talking about black. You're talking about gender problems, not racial, but gender. Mm -hmm. So all these issues are inside the United States. So the United States is not dealing well with its own uh, human rights policies inside the United States. So why you go advocate or, or trying to, to, to touch in other people's problems? Solve your problems first, okay? So that's the first thing. So, so I think it's a characteristics of the United States. Even when they are not called upon to go to some place, they believe it's their duty, okay? And uh, something that I'm from Brazil, I disagree, okay? I think uh, the Chinese policy in that case of respect, sovereignty of other countries are much important. Each one knows how to take care. You have cultural influences, you have uh, social structure influences, okay? The United States is gonna have a really hard time to go back to the council. It, it, it needs to do a really multilateral diplomacy for be accepted. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, I believe that one of the requirements, many countries, they want to ask the United States is this, okay, work out your own problems, mm -hmm. interfere less in other countries' problems. And I think would be, would be nice because the United States has many problems in terms of the, what CIA, FBI does outside the country, you take for Cuba, Guantanamo is a good example, okay? They arrest a lot of people that they so-called terrorists. They are not terrorists, mm. uh, okay? They, 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 they are activists. That is a big difference in that sense, okay? You, you, you hear about torture. You hear about uh, a lot of uh, war crimes. You, you have a very uh, sensitive issue. So stay where you are and work your problems. D don't go to other countries try to... To, to, to point fingers. I think it's a, it's a wrong decision and I, I'm sure Biden government is much more sensitive to those issues than was Donald Trump. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's, it's easier to criticize others than to look inward, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, yes. And yeah of course, uh, we all feel that Biden's government will be more mature and more capable at dealing with these things. I'm not sure if the direction has completely changed. So we'll stop talking about other countries and we'll talk about uh, China and Brazil as well, yes. okay? <laughs>they're both emerging markets with considerable populations and the two are also mutually beneficial with plentiful exchanges between the respective governments and between the people. China is Brazil's largest trading partner with great demand in China for Brazilian agricultural products and iron ore and more and more Chinese businesses are choosing to invest here in Brazil. Uh, as a former government minister and a renowned economist who is intimately familiar with these two countries and their markets, what do you consider are the areas with the greatest potential for further cooperation between Brazil and China? And what opportunities must Brazil and other South American countries grasp as soon as possible? I, I think the relations uh, between Brazil and China has changed 
since really has jumped in a good and a positive direction since the year of 2000. Okay? Okay. Traditionally, China was the third partner of Brazil until uh, it was United States, uh, Latin American countries, and then China and sometimes European in China. But after 2000, China really, uh, I would say, worked very hard to be one of the, 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 the first trade partners in Brazil, and it is right now, okay, after 20 years, two decades, mm. uh, is the first uh, FDI foreign direct investor in, in Brazil as well, in many strategic areas like energy, infrastructure, very important. This year already, uh, in terms of trade, comparing last year, we are up almost 15%. The exports, yeah, six billion dollars in trade. So, so that's a very good numbers. Okay. Uh, most important is that uh, we need to evolve besides only trade and investment. I think there is a lot of uh, a lot of uh, I would say ground to cover in terms of tourism. China is the first uh, uh, country to send tourists out of China after the pandemic. I think and I believe s since I was the minister of trade for a while. I believe that we had to have a special plan for Chinese to visit Brazil, okay, and show different things because Brazil is complementary to China in many aspects. And I think there is an area that we need to, to foster is the exchange of uh, technology, university and science technology cooperation. We are not very strong on this and I think, answer your question, what's Latin American countries can take from that, I think is to have a better participation in Belt and Road Initiative, okay? Uh, not just covering infrastructure projects, but basically science technology, uh, science technology parks, uh, and attract uh, more Chinese in terms of investment in innovation and technology. I think that's where Chinese are, are, are willing to go. That's fascinating. So, of course, Belt and Road is a very broad-ranging an initiative that could include all kinds of investment uh, yeah. uh, opportunities. And so you think uh, some uh, new technology is something that South America can also help China with? Yes, uh, that is different mm. technology. For example, when you take the, you, you, you see how China is evolving in, in several important technology. If you take, for example, logistics, yeah. satellite, mm. uh, IoT, artificial intelligence, big data, all these technologies are being uh, d not just developed by China, but China has in some of them leadership in the world. Okay, mm. we are talking about big data, we are talking about satellite technology. Okay, mm. those technologies are very important for Latin America because we don't have it. Let me give an example. Latin America is one of the powerhouses in producing of agriculture. Mm. Satellite technology, in low orbit satellite, can help to improve and to control uh, the, the performance and the productivity of agriculture in Latin America. Okay, uh, yeah. so how we combine this? How we transfer technology that will at the, at the end benefit China? Why? Mm. Because if you have a better and more productive in terms of agriculture, this goes back to, to the Chinese uh, consumers in terms of quantities, qualities and price. The same in logistics, okay? If you invest, and that's what Chinese have been doing, if you invest in infrastructure in Latin America, obviously the cost of logistics is going to go down and the mm -hmm. price of the products that China buys go down. So it's a win-win situation. Mm, okay, sounds very promising indeed. And you mentioned already uh, tourism as an area for uh, future uh, further cooperation. So even though the international movement of people right now is largely restricted, the trend towards greater integration between countries and peoples remains. And Brazil is a very important market for Chinese and also world tourism. So if in the future I'm going to visit Brazil for a holiday, uh, what sites or what cultural experiences do you think I really have to go and enjoy? Yeah. Let me talk just a step back. Uh, although we are in pandemic, people cannot go from one place to another. Uh, the Brazilian government and uh, the governments around the world can promote Brazil uh -huh. because you are at home. So why don't give you uh, elements exactly in that question that mm. you ask, where I could go? What is the packages I have? You don't mm. need to go, but you research. Uh, yep. More than 75% of tourism around the world, they research mm. before they go abroad. They want to see it. It's not because you cannot travel right now that you cannot absorb knowledge about the country. Sure. Okay, so, so that's my first comment. And, and that's what Brazil is not doing right now. Okay? The second element you ask me where you can go. In Brazil, as China 
is very uh, is a large country very diversified south from north is the same as china south is cold north is hot okay mm -hmm. so i would say okay if you want to see for example natural resources okay in terms of beaches forests mm -hmm. brazil is very rich in biodiversity so i would tend to tell chinese people first uh, if they want to see a city okay they can go to rio de janeiro of course is our is our first place people would go okay mm -hmm. why because you have an integration between a city and the biodiversity but there is two places that you cannot miss in brazil one is the amazon forest mm -hmm. in in the north of brazil why because you're going to see a biodiversity that you will not find in any place in the world mm. and the second place is called pantanal is the center of the country it's it's a different biodiversity with tropical forests okay. and with a, a wildlife uh, that is amazing in the third place i would recommend not in this order of course but would be the northeast of brazil that has one of the most uh, uh, I would say uh, coastlines, most beautiful coastlines in the world, okay, and uh, they are very close to each other, and you can go and, and see different cities, and with that you can see our culture, with that you can see our gastronomy. So I think in those three locations, the uh, uh, the northeast with the beaches scenery, the north with the Amazon forest, and the center of Brazil. Uh, with the tropical forest, you can see all. Oh, and ov obviously, when you are in the center of Brazil, you can stop in Brasilia. Mm -hmm. That is an architecture uh, world-renowned city. It was a planned city. So it's really beautiful. A and you can see how the capital of Brazil is built and how it works. Okay. I noticed you didn't mention your own home. Uh, no, <laughs> is it because but you're too familiar? Uh, no, <laughs> I didn't mention my own home because it's too large. Ah. And if you to like China, if you want to visit China, you need at least three, four months. Yeah. <laughs> so giving options for people would say go to those places because I think it would be uh, a different experience than okay. China. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. <laughs> and finally, we would like to invite you to offer a greeting in Chinese because I know you speak some Chinese to the global Chinese community who are right behind this camera. 大家好，我是复兴老师，祝大家。Fu Shou Ankam.